Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak with Dr. David Grabowski, a professor of healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Grabowski is an expert in all things about nursing homes, from the quality of care to the adequacy of payment. We spoke about what COVID-19 is telling us about how our systems for older adults need to change. Let's listen. Dr. Grabowski, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. You have spent your career working on improving nursing homes and care for older adults. This has not been a great moment for nursing homes. There's been thousands and thousands of people who have died. How have you seen this crisis unfold? Yeah, thanks first for for having me on today. It has been just terrible. Nursing homes have been completely decimated on multiple levels. So we've seen, in terms of fatalities, 60,000 plus fatalities in nursing homes so far a huge number. Uh, Beyond the fatalities, however, nursing homes have basically been locked down since March. So no visitors, no communal activities, no communal dining. Nursing homes are really challenging places right now to live, regardless of whether COVID is in the building. And I'd also say nursing homes have been really challenging places to work right now. We've seen nearly 700 staff members die nationally Many have become sick themselves and put their families at risk. This is a really scary time. Remember, Josh, that most of the staff in nursing homes, they're making close to minimum wage. They're disproportionately women, immigrants, minorities. So this has really kind of drawn into focus some of the inequities that we see elsewhere in our healthcare system. So nursing homes right now, it's a really tough situation. So you've written about how this enormous crisis facing nursing homes may reflect some weaknesses in the underlying nursing home model. And part of your argument has been that this isn't the first infectious disease set of challenges that have erupted at nursing homes. What about the nursing home model that we have in this country creates risks for the spread of potentially lethal infectious diseases? Sure. So we have a very institutional model of nursing home care in this country. The average nursing home is roughly 100 beds in this country. Uh, We have this awful term, semi-private rooms, that basically means shared rooms. So that's two, two, three, four residents living together in a common room, sharing a bathroom along a sort of a, a, a long hallway, the rooms kind of closely clustered together. So we've taken this model, uh, unlike other countries that have employed sort of small home models with individual rooms. In the U.S., we largely kind of have these big institutional settings that almost feel like hospitals. And really, uh, although they may provide adequate nursing, they don't really feel like a home. And I think in many ways, they contribute to the spread we often see in these different outbreaks. So we've seen flu outbreaks, we've seen gastrointestinal outbreaks, many of them. Absolutely. This has never been, I think, nursing home strong suit for not just the sort of physical layout of these buildings, but also, Josh, think about the type of services that are being delivered in a nursing home. These are high-touch services. This is assisting residents with bathing and dressing and toileting. These aren't services you can provide from six feet away. And yes, you as a caregiver might be wearing adequate personal protective equipment, but are you going to be able to have a a resident who has advanced dementia? Are you going to get them to wash their hands regularly? Are you going to get them to wear a mask? So there's not just challenges with the physical layout. There's also challenges with the needs of the residents and the types of services that are being provided. The other kind of structural factor that creates these challenges is how nursing homes are paid. Absolutely. So we have two 
main payers of, of nursing home services in this country. We have Medicare paying for short stay services. We have Medicaid paying for long stay services. What I mean by short services, these are post acute rehabilitative services. So, an individual's discharged from the hospital might have a, a several week stay in a nursing home. Medicare is a very generous payer of nursing home services. Then we have Medicaid for that individual with dementia, potentially, she might be spending the rest of her life in that nursing home. Medicaid is the payer here. Medicaid is not a very generous payer of services. And so, nursing homes have this very challenging model of needing to take sort of the the high revenue Medicare patients and cross subsidize the care of these long stay Medicaid residents who are going to be there for maybe months, even years. So talk to me about what kind of companies take on that challenge and whether there are problems in that part of the model too. Absolutely. So we, like other parts of the healthcare economy, we have you know, for-profits and, and non-profits here. Non-profits make up about 25% of all facilities. Some of our best nursing homes are non-profits and they tend to, to do more of the private pay care in this market. They have fewer Medicaid recipients. There's a lot more Medicaid residents on the, on the for-profit side of the market. So we've seen some kind of bifurcation, if you will, across kind of the types of residents that are, that are cared for across these different types of facilities. And even the for-profits in that part of the market, they're different sectors. So some are private equity owned and maybe trying to extract money. Is that an unfair statement? No, I don't think that's unfair. What's really interesting, 20, 25 years ago, a chain was a, was a nursing home chain and they had a common owner and, and operator model. Today, many of the big chains are now owned by private equity groups or real estate investment trusts. And they've actually separated the ownership from the operations. And that's really, I think, problematic potentially during normal times. But during kind of the, the COVID pandemic, where we have a owner who holds the most valuable asset in terms of the real estate, and then the operator trying to, to make ends meet in terms of delivering care while also having to pay their rent to this private equity group. It's a challenging model. And so I, I think it's one that we'll want to revisit uh, you know, as, as we think back about this pandemic and how to kind of potentially reform how we finance and organize and oversee nursing homes in this country, because I, I, yeah. this has really exposed that this model doesn't work for sort of the, the operations here of a nursing home. I definitely want to turn to some of the solutions, but one last kind of aspect of this to probe a little bit further is the staffing. Because when you have low reimbursement for Medicaid, like you talked about, when you have you know, private equity and other major groups really trying to run nursing homes at relatively close to the cost, I guess, and and keep them running kind of at a basic level while pulling out what they can. That has all kinds of implications for staffing. And can you maybe elaborate on that a bit? Absolutely. So I've been studying nursing homes for two plus decades staff are the most important predictor of resident outcomes. Um, Two-thirds of expenditures for for nursing homes are staff. And I think for those listeners that have never been in a nursing home that may be more familiar with the hospital model or a physician's office, the workforce in a nursing home is very different in that there there are few doctors, there are some RNs and LPNs, but the vast majority of the workforce are certified nurse aides or CNAs. They're making close to to minimum wage. We underpay them and we undervalue them in in a lot of our nursing homes. And I think it's been a it's been a longstanding issue, obviously predating COVID. How do we get more dollars into into their pockets and not into the pockets of private equity groups or CEOs or other entities? A lot of work suggests that the more we sort of pay the these staff, the the better the outcomes in terms of of quality of care. But it's been a real challenge in a sector kind of built on Medicaid with with Medicaid accounting for the vast majority of the dollars and the bed days. How do we get more more resources to those direct caregivers? And is it true that one of the consequences of the low wages is that people may work at multiple nursing homes, which increases the risk for the spread of infectious disease? 
Yeah, absolutely. And there was a really interesting paper that came out last week, a working paper by a group of economists that suggested, you know, nearly half of the the spread of the cases was due to staff just moving across nursing homes. And what they did, which was really interesting, Josh, they they used geolocation data from cell phones and just watched the staff kind of moving nursing home to nursing home. And just because of this low pay, we know a lot of the staff have to kind of make ends meet by working multiple jobs across multiple facilities. And that's been a real big part of the outbreak of COVID across facilities. So there are a number of people who are focused on the short term of what can be done for nursing homes, more PPE, testing, those sorts of things. But even when you've thrown the book at a nursing home, you can still get cases. We still haven't solved that problem. You're talking about some of the structural reasons why nursing homes are at such high risk. So if we said, okay, let's also, in parallel, tackle some of these structural issues, what would be on your agenda? Yeah, if I I was going to go after these big structural issues, let's first, let's fix how we pay for care. So we have these two major payers. Let's bring costs in line with payments here. And we know that we have one group of patients where we have really high profits around these short stay patients. We have this other group of long stay residents where it's relatively unprofitable. And These are both government payers. So is there a way to kind of align payments to much better match the cost of caring for these two different types of of residents? So that would be my kind of first point on my my agenda. The, The second big issue is how we regulate care. You and I have been talking about this, but we know most of the residents here aren't able to monitor their own care. That we need a strong regulatory model in place to oversee this, to make certain nursing homes are putting dollars into into direct patient care and not into the pockets of private equity groups. And so not just monitoring spending, but also going in and and monitoring care. The problem there, Josh, and I've been very critical of our regulatory model. We have a lot of regulations on the books. But it often has this feel of a checkbox mentality that we're not regulating the right sets of of activities. And we're also not tying kind of problems within nursing homes to quality improvement. And so I might go in right now during COVID and and find a nursing home, for example, that has these sets of issues. You're not wearing your PPE correctly or you're not washing your hands as you go into rooms. Why can't we go in then with a quality improvement organization and actually teach this, this nursing home? best practices rather than simply giving them a a deficiency. We haven't kind of closed the loop there on quality improvement. And then the final point I'd make is I I think we need to make quality of care more more transparent. We we do have the Nursing Home Compare website, which is a report card. But I think if you or your listeners went on that website, I, I think you'd be underwhelmed at the types of measures and metrics that are on there. And I don't know that they would approximate what you want from quality of care, what maybe your, your listeners want from, from a facility. Trying to, to actually get measures that better match the interests of and the kind of needs of potential consumers, I think is really an important step. Great. Well, those points are all well taken. I want to ask you one bigger question, though, which is, should we try to have fewer people in nursing homes altogether? I mean, should we try to pull back from this model as much as we can and think about alternative ways to support older adults and others who need that level of care? Yeah, I absolutely. I, I think we can think about not just reforming nursing home services, but reforming how we deliver long-term care in this country. And I, I would point towards a country like the Netherlands. So they spend more than we do on, on long-term care, but they spend their money differently as well. They have very generous home and community-based care services, and so they try to care for older adults in the community wherever possible. They actually ration nursing home care. We have the exact opposite approach here in the U.S. We ration home and community-based care. There's over a million individuals nationally on the wait list to get home and community-based care services from Medicaid, yet we provide nursing home services relatively abundantly. And so if you're an older adult and you have long-term care needs, it's much easier for you to access nursing home care than it is to access home and community-based care. That's upside down. We should very much model ourselves after the Netherlands and other countries that have made home and community-based care much more abundant and try to keep individuals wherever possible out of nursing homes. I really appreciate this conversation because I think it may not be at this exact moment, as there's still an enormous pressure and scramble to protect nursing homes in the heat of the pandemic. 
But there will come a time where we have to take a step back and see whether what we're doing is the right thing. And I think you have written and today we've been able to talk about what that right thing needs to be. So thank you so much for joining me. Great. Thanks for having me on. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Thank you.